All right, well, welcome back to our last month of woven for the spring. Can you believe it? May is already here, and I am so excited to get to wrap up with a new woven woman of the Bible that honestly kind of reminded me of last May. I sent us out for the summer hoping to teach on Esther, but I just couldn't get past Queen Vashti in chapter one. Similar to that, this month, our woven woman of the Bible is going to be a woman named JL. You may or may not know JL, but you can't tell JL's story without also telling Deborah's story because it's tucked within it. And you may have heard of Deborah. We find their story in Judges 4 and 5. So it's kind of a two for one this month as we get to learn about both JL and Deborah. But surely by now you realize I love sharing these stories of the women we really don't know. And so JL is the one I'm specifically looking at, but we've got a lot to learn from and a lot of scripture to cover. I'm going to be in the New Living Translation, so feel free to read along with me or enjoy story time. I will not be reading all of Judges 4 and 5, but quite a bit of it. Judges 4 is a story. Judges 5 is a song. Interestingly enough, that song is considered one of the oldest pieces of literature in the Old Testament by most scholars. And so both of them actually are meant to be read together. They interpret one another and support one another, and it's really great. We're going to see that on display, but I'm not going to read all of Judges 5, that song. I'll skip over a little bit uh, for the sake of time, but you're welcome to dig in all this month. Sound good? So let's jump in. Judges chapter 4. I will make a note really quickly um, for context. If you're not familiar with the time of Judges, uh, it was pretty rough. Um, this story of Deborah as a judge is one of the better ones, uh, but we see that the judges um, just kind of steadily decrease in terms of righteousness. And the book of Judges actually ends uh, by saying, let me find it. <laughs> The last verse of Judges says, In those days Israel had no king. All the people did whatever seemed right in their own eyes. Which is pretty heavy. So if you get to read the book of Judges this summer, I encourage you to. It's a lot. I think if it was a show, I don't think it'd be on cable TV. I think it would be on Hulu or something heavy that can handle it. <laughs> um, TVMA. Like, uh, Judges is a lot. Um, and so... Just know that coming into it, there's a cycle of the judges where Israel disobeys God, they abandon him, they pursue evil, and then God hands them over to their enemies, and then Israel cries out for God's rescue, and God raises up a judge to deliver them. And then that judge dies. Israel again abandons God, pursues evil. God hands them over to their enemy. They cry out for God's rescue. God raises up a judge to deliver them. And then that judge dies. And the cycle of judges continues. I'm telling you that before we read, just so you have an idea of the cultural context of what's taking place. Because when we jump into Judges 4, we're going to read about a guy named Ehud. And he was the previous judge. And you're going to see this cycle of judges taking place. Okay, let's roll. Judges 4. After Ehud's death, the Israelites again did evil in the Lord's sight. So the Lord turned them over to King Haben, Javan of Hazor, a Canaanite king. The commander of his army was Sisera, who lived in Herosheth Hagoyim. Sisera had 900 iron chariots, ruthlessly oppressed the Israelites for 20 years. Then the people of Israel cried out to the Lord for help. Deborah the wife of Lapidoth, was a prophet who was judging Israel at that time. She would sit under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim, and the Israelites would go to her for judgment. One day, she sent for Barak, son of Abinoam, who lived in Kadesh in the land of Naphtali. She said to him, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, commands you. Call out 10,000 warriors from the tribes of Naphtali and Zebulun at Mount Tabor, and I will call out Sisera, commander of Jabin's army, along with his chariots and warriors to the Kishon River. There I will give you victory over him. Barak told her, I will go, but only if you go with me. Very well, she replied, I will go with you, but you will receive no honor in this venture, for the Lord's victory over Sisera will be at the hands of a woman. 
So Deborah went with Barak to Kadesh. At Kadesh, Barak called together the tribes of Zebulun and Naphtali, and 10,000 warriors went up with him. Deborah also went with him. Now Haber, the Kenite, a descendant of Moses' brother-in-law, Hobab, had moved away from the other members of his tribe and pitched his tent by the oak of Zananim near Kadesh. When Sisera was told that Barak, son of Abinoam, had gone up to Mount Tabor, he called for all 900 of his iron chariots and all of his warriors, and they marched from Harosheth Hagoim to the Kishon River. Then Deborah said to Barak, Get ready. This is the day the Lord will give you victory over Sisera, for the Lord is marching ahead of you. So Barak led his 10,000 warriors down the slopes of Mount Tabor into battle. When Barak attacked, the Lord threw Sisera and all his chariots and warriors into a panic. Sisera leaped down from his chariot and escaped on foot. Then Barak chased the chariots and the enemy army all the way to Harosheth Hagoyim, killing all of Sisera's warriors. Not a single one was left alive. Meanwhile, Sisera ran to the tent of Jael the wife of Heber the Kenite, because Heber's family was on friendly terms with King Jabin of Hazor. Jael went out to meet Sisera and said to him, Come into my tent, sir. Come in. Don't be afraid. So he went into her tent, and she covered him with a blanket. Please give me some water, he said. I'm thirsty. So she gave him some milk from a leather bag and covered him again. Stand at the door of the tent, he told her. If anybody comes and asks you if there is anyone here, say no. But when Sisera fell asleep from exhaustion, Jael quietly crept up to him with a hammer and tent peg in her hand. Then she drove the tent peg through his temple and into the ground, and so he died. When Barak came looking for Sisera, Jael went out to meet him. She said, come, and I will show you the man you are looking for. So he followed her into the tent and found Sisera, lying there dead with the tent peg through his temple. So on that day, Israel saw God defeat Jabin, the Canaanite king. And from that time on, Israel became stronger and stronger against King Jabin until they finally destroyed him. Now we're going to read the song. I know, this is a wild story, huh? Hello, judges. <laughs> On that day, Deborah and Barak, son of Abinoam, sang this song. Israel's leaders took charge, and the people gladly followed. Praise the Lord. Listen, you kings. Pay attention, you mighty rulers, for I will sing to the Lord. I will make music to the Lord, the God of Israel. Lord, when you set out from Seir and marched across the fields of Edom, the earth trembled and the cloudy skies poured down rain. The mountains quaked in the presence of the Lord, the God of Mount Sinai, in the presence of the Lord, the God of of Israel, in the days of Shamgar, son of Anath, and in the days of Jael, people avoided the main roads and travelers stayed on winding pathways. There were few people left in the villages of Israel until Deborah arose as a mother for Israel. When Israel chose new gods, war erupted at the city gates, yet not a shield or spear could be seen among 40,000 warriors in Israel. My heart is with the commanders of Israel, with those who volunteered for war. Praise the Lord. Consider this, you who ride on fine donkeys, you who sit on fancy saddle blankets, and you who walk along the road. Listen to the village musicians gathered at the watering holes. They recount the righteous victories of the Lord and the victories of his villagers in Israel. Then the people of the Lord march down to the city gates. Wake up, Deborah, wake up, wake up, wake up, and sing a song. Arise, Barak, lead your captives away, son of Abinoam. Down from Tabor marched the few against the nobles. The people of the Lord marched down against mighty warriors. I'm going to skip ahead now to verse 24. Most blessed among women is Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite. May she be blessed above all women who live in tents. Sisera asked for water, and she gave him milk. In a bowl fit for nobles, she brought him yogurt. Then with her left hand, she reached for a tent peg, and with her right hand for the workman's hammer. She struck Sisera with the hammer, crushing his head. With a shattering blow, she pierced his temples. He sank, he fell, he lay still at her feet, and where he sank, there he died. From the window, Sisera's mother looked out. Through the window, she watched for his return, saying, Why is his chariot so long in coming? 
Why don't we hear the sound of chariot wheels? Her wise women answer, and she repeats these words to herself. They must be dividing the captured plunder with a woman or two for every man. There will be colorful robes for Sisera and colorful embroidered robes for me. Yes, the plunder will include colorful robes embroidered on both sides. Lord, may all your enemies die like Sisera, but may those who love you rise like the sun in all its power. Then there was peace in the land for 40 years. Whew. Heavy. We got to go out with a bang, right? Come on. So here we are in Judges. I described it's a crazy time, honestly, uh, with Deborah, one of the better judges. For sure. So we know Deborah as a judge, but she's also a prophet, much like we learned about last month with Hulda, also a prophet, not the only ones. So Deborah is a prophet and a judge. And actually, there's only one other person who served as both prophet and judge around this time. And that would have been Samuel, who's coming up later. And we love Samuel. Samuel's great. So Samuel and Deborah, kind of cut from the same cloth, <laughs> prophet and judge. So here... We're going to just journey through, if that's okay. So Deborah's prophet and judge, and she approaches Barak. So Barak is the general, like the army general for Israel. And she has this word from God for Barak, because remember, prophets speak for God to people. And so she says in verse 6, this is what the Lord God of Israel commands you. Call out 10,000 warriors. And she's saying, okay, get everybody together, and then go to the Kishon River, and he says, there I will give you victory over Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army. So King Jabin is listed as the Canaanite king. So that would have been Israel's enemies and oppressors, okay? So he's saying, hey, we're going to go into battle. You need to get your troops ready. And I will give you victory over him. I don't want us to miss that as we read through all of this. Where does the victory come from? It comes from God always comes from God. It does not come from Barak. It does not come from Deborah. It does not come from Jael. The victory comes from God. So don't miss that. I'm going to point it out a few times. I'm going to go ahead and let you know that now. So Barak hears this word from God through Deborah acting as prophet. And Barak tells her in verse 8, I will go, but only if you go with me. Now, if you've heard this story of Deborah before, like I have, chances are you've also heard Barak be treated as this really cowardly, weak guy, right? Which really shames him and women because it's like, well, he had to get Deborah to go with him. I mean, what does that actually mean? I feel like nobody wins from that kind of an interpretation. But we've got to wrestle with that because in Hebrews 11, you may be familiar with the Hall of Faith. Barak is listed in that. So all the way in the New Testament in Hebrews, Barak is noted for his faith. So how does that equate to him being cowardly and weak? It really doesn't. So I have a, another way we can interpret this that I promise did not originate, originate with me. Several commentators have something to say about this in its context. Remember that prophets speak for God to people. So that's who Deborah is. Deborah is judge and prophet. So Deborah proclaims this word of God. Okay, guess what? It's time to raise up the troops. We're going to battle. I'm going to give you victory. He says, okay, I'll go, but only if you go with me. Who does Deborah represent as prophet? She represents God. She speaks for God to people. So he's saying, I'm not going to go into battle unless God is with me, right? Unless this prophet of God who's going to speak for God and provide encouragement and guidance and clarity and support comes with me. I don't understand where the shame is in that. That's an example of how we can interpret things just from our own modern day culture, but it's really not happening in the text. <laughs> so no shame on Barak, no shame on Deborah. They're hearing God's word and he's like, yeah, I'll go, but you're coming with me. And she does. We're going to see how she provides guidance, encouragement, and support from God to Barak as they're fighting this battle that God has asked them to do. So she says in verse 9, Very well, I will go with you. But you will receive no honor in this venture, for the Lord's victory over Sisera will be at the hands of a woman. Now here is another way that's actually, I just think it's a cool thing about Barak, like humble. He's still going to go into battle, even though he knows he's not going to get any honor. 
I mean, what is that? Like, we're going to have victory, but the honor's not going to be mine. And the plot twist, remember, these stories were told in the context of community, passed down from generation to generation. I love to imagine the people of God sitting around this campfire at night just telling these amazing stories of God that had so much more richness in its original language, by the way. (laughs) And so they would have been listening. And these are some plot twists because it's like, okay, I'll go, but only if you go with me. And she's like, okay, I'll go, but you're not going to get any honor. Why? Because the Lord's victory will be at the hands of a woman. So everyone who hears this, Barak included, but those who are hearing this story, assumes who that woman is. Obviously, it's going to be Deborah, right? That's who he's inviting to come. Not quite the case. We're going to see who that woman is in a minute. So they go, and Deborah finally gets to this point where she's like, hey, Barak, get ready. In verse 14, this is the day the Lord will give you victory over Sisera, for the Lord is marching ahead of you. Do you notice who's giving the victory? The Lord. Who's marching ahead of him? The Lord. We can't miss it. Who is the victor? It's God. He is the hero of this story. So they head down into battle. Verse 15, when Barak attacked the Lord through Sisera and all his chariots and warriors into a panic. Who is helping him in battle? God. (laughs) And I know I keep saying that, but I just think we miss it. And so look at the power of God. So basically, they're in battle and God uses Barak to basically take out all, like all of Sisera's armies. That's so wild. So Sisera's the general of King Jabin's army, the Canaanites, and he has 900 iron chariots. And God leads Barak and helps Barak to take them all out, except there's one, Sisera. Sisera flees away on foot. So this is where we meet Jael, because Jael is married to Heber, the Kenite. So it's important to note that Jael is not an Israelite. Jael is actually a descendant by marriage through Heber, the Kenite, of Moses' brother-in-law, Hobab. Moses' brother-in-law, Hobab, was the son of Jethro. This might help you. So in Exodus chapter 2, we see that Moses flees from the Pharaoh to the land of Midian, where he marries Zipporah, who is the daughter of Jethro, also known as Rule. So it is his son, Hobab, from whom Jael's husband descends. Does this make sense? So they're similar, but not quite. She is not an Israelite. But her husband, for some reason it says in verse 11, has moved away from the other members of his tribe and pitched a tent somewhere else. And then we see in verse 17 that her husband's family was on friendly terms with King Jabin of Hazor. Why this is, I have no idea. But it's really interesting that her family has gotten cozy with the enemy king. But it makes sense why then Sisera would have thought he had a safe place to come with Jael in her tent. Because they're supposed to be on friendly terms. And she certainly lures him in. As she comes out and says, come into my tent, sir. Come in. Don't be afraid. So she goes to her tent and she covers him with a blanket. He says, please give me some water. And she gives him milk. It's interesting because whatever he had in mind when he comes into her tent, now Jael has taken this kind of like motherly posture, right? She's tucking him in, giving him some milk before bed. He's tired. Get some rest. Which you can note in terms of there's like motherly language throughout this, as Deborah is about to be called the mother of Israel, and we also compare that to Sisera's mom. Um, just a little mental note that you can chew on all month. So she gives him some milk, he falls asleep, and here's the crux. Jael grabs her tent peg. She lives in tents. She's nomadic. She's independent. She's doing her thing. She grabs her tent. She grabs peg. She grabs her hammer and she hammers that tent peg into his temple all the way to the ground and he kills him. Huge deal. So now not only has the enemy king's army all died at Barak's leadership, but empowered by God, then now Jael has taken out the enemy general. So Deborah's prophecy is fulfilled, but it's not Deborah who kills him. It's Jael, which like who would have expected Jael? She's not even an Israelite. And I don't know what motivated Jael to do this, but the point is she accomplished God's purposes. Like we should see God again as a hero. God is doing some big stuff here and he's going to use people to accomplish 
his purposes, not based on them, but on him. And so uh, it says, on that day, Israel saw God defeated Jabin, the Canaanite king. Again, who defeated him? Wasn't Jael, wasn't Barak, wasn't Deborah. It's God. And from that time on, Israel became stronger and stronger against King Jabin until they finally destroyed him. So Israel is getting to see God's power at work, right? Israel is getting to see God fight for them. It's a huge, huge deal. So Deborah sings this song. Barak sings with her, but it's primarily Deborah singing. And I want us to read this song because, I mean, I already read it, but I'm going to talk about some high points because I think we see an example of something that we can learn from as women today. I don't know about you, but I feel like us as women, it is so easy for us to compare ourselves to one another and compete with one another rather than celebrating one another. Like there's enough room at the table, y'all. There's enough room for us to celebrate our sister as she is being used by God and we can be doing that too. Man, there is enough up against us in the world, especially in this day. We don't need to be tearing each other apart. We should be lifting each other up, celebrating and rejoicing in how God uses us. And so what I love about Deborah in this is that she kind of is behind the scenes. And as she sings this song, what does she say in verse 24? Most blessed among women is Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite. May she be blessed above all women who live in tents. Like Deborah was able to say that about Jael, who's not an Israelite, who is used by God to accomplish God's purposes. So should we. We should be quick to lift up and encourage and celebrate our sisters who God uses for his glory and his purposes. And I know that the context of this and the context of today is very different. So hear me, I am not saying that we should go out and get our own tent pegs and hammers and just start hammering temples of dudes to the ground. Heck no, I did not say that. (laughs) God did not say that. But in this time and in this place and in this culture, listen, Sisera, King Jabin, this was like straight up evil long-term evil. And if we miss it, we see it clear as day in the language of Sisera's mother here at the end of the song. She's looking out the window. She's wondering, where is he? What's taking so long? And she says she must be, he must be dividing the captured plunder in verse 30 with a woman or two for every man, with a woman or two for every man. The Hebrew word for woman there is actually more detailed. It's a womb, with a womb or two for every man. Sisera and his armies were known for plundering and raping these women, young women and virgins, when they would come and conquer and do battle. You don't think that grieves God's heart? So here's the irony. That again, we can miss in our English translation, but they would not have missed in the original story in Hebrew. Verse 27 in the song, it says, He sank, he fell, he lay still at her feet. This is talking about Sisera and Jael. And when it says he lay still at her feet, that other word for feet would have been, it really is like he lay still between her legs. And I know this is very visual, but I'm just saying what's happening here uh, is a reversal of uh, sexual assault, of rape language. What Jael is doing to Sisera, forcing this tent peg into his temple um, and him dying between her legs is actually God using her to rescue the young virgins and young women who would have been potentially raped in the future and had been in the past. This is a huge statement. This is a big deal. There is a lot of symbolism that's taking place here. And so God uses jail not just to take down the enemy army general, but God uses jail to defend and protect so many of his daughters. Maybe you didn't notice that. It's easy to miss. And it's, again, TVMA. Like, this is pretty intense content. But if we don't talk about it here, then where? (laughs) Um, I love, again, that God fights for us. That God is grieved by the things that grieve us. God does not delight in injustice. So God is using who he chooses to accomplish his greatest purpose. 
What's neat to me is that Deborah, Barack, and Jael are three very different people. Obviously, male and female. They are of different tribes and nations. They're of different callings and titles. And yet God brings them together across what could separate them from one another, these walls and barriers that could be put up between their gender, their nationality, their title, their calling. God brings them together, and they are better together to accomplish the purposes of God. Why am I saying this? Because I think that's something for us to hear in today's culture. As it is natural for us to choose to spend time with people who are just like us. Totally natural. It is supernatural for us to choose to spend time with people who are very different than us. But this is the call of God. This is the call of the church. Jesus said himself in John 13, 35, by this everyone will know that you are my disciples, by how you love one another. Meaning that in the church, we should be bound together in such a way that you cannot explain it based on things you can see. Across political lines, genders, socioeconomic statuses, races, you name it. We should be bound together in the name of Jesus because that makes our testimony that much stronger. We are a greater witness together because the world looks at us and says, why on earth would you not only spend time together, but you would choose to do it and delight in it? And fruit would come from it, like life-giving fruit, like transformation is coming from your coming together. The only explanation for that is God. The only explanation for that is Jesus. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples by how you love one another. We are, in the kingdom of God, better together. Not only to accomplish God's greater purposes, we can do more together than we can on our own. That's totally true. But also, our witness is stronger to the world who needs to know Jesus. The true character of God is known when we come together for God's purposes. Because right now, I'm going to be honest, last week I was talking uh, with a shop owner at a mall and I was talking with him and he was telling me that he grew up in the church, but since in the last 10 years has left organized religion. Why? Well, he met this girl who he fell in love with and he wants to spend the rest of his life with her. And she grew up in a family that wanted nothing to do with God both her parents and her grandparents. And they actively would tell her that God was, well, not who he is. That he was hateful, he's not true, just so many lies to, this girl grew up hearing that. And so this shop owner met this girl, fell in love with her, and he said, I have experienced more kindness and joy from her than anyone I know who claims the name of Jesus. Y'all, do we hear that? It makes him struggle to believe that there's God. And if this makes you question, I'm okay with that because I know that God's going to meet you in your quest. But I think it's heartbreaking because the character of God that we are communicating when we choose to only associate with those who are like us and we condemn those who are not like us is not the character of God. We are not communicating that God is love, that God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him doesn't need to fear death because we can live with him forever. Friends, we have an invitation not to live a natural life, but a supernatural one. And I pray that you found, even in your thread groups, in the diversity within your thread groups, that we are better together. I pray you've seen that. I pray you've seen that you can get to know God better in the context of this diverse community. And I challenge you, to let that spread, to seek after those who are even more different. Not because they're different, but because you get to know God through them. Isn't it incredible that God has created us to be so incredibly diverse and that we are created in the image of God, meaning we get to know God better through the diversity of one another. But we've got to seek that out in today's culture. But we should. There's so much beauty there both for us to accomplish God's purposes better together, but for the world to know God better through our collective unified witness. This story closes, the song closes by saying, then there was peace in the land for 40 years. So for 40 years, as Deborah being judge, there is peace in the land. 
So this again, this is one of the better judge stories throughout Judges. But again, please go and keep reading in Judges throughout the summer. I encourage you to. It is very, um, it, well, it'll keep you reading. That's all I'll say. Um, and you'll have questions. That's great. Just chew on them. Because here's the thing. Even though Woven is officially concluding for the spring at the end of May, you have full permission to keep on hanging out. Keep reading the Word of God. Keep meeting together. Keep praying together. Keep encouraging one another. You've learned. I mean, you can open the Bible and this question of how do you see your story in this person's story, you can use that every time. Your six questions on your bookmark, I pray you keep those for the rest of your life. Honestly. They're great questions. What do you like about the story? What do you wrestle with in this story? What does this story teach us about God? What does this story teach us about people? Now that I've heard this story, how should I live different? And who do I know who needs to hear this story? I promise you, you can use those questions for your own personal Bible study with anything you read in scripture. You can use those questions to lead your own Bible study wherever you go. You can also use those questions to debrief and better understand messages that you hear, like this one, or sermons on a Sunday. You can use those questions to debrief and grow from opportunities that you have to serve God, whether it's here in the Dallas community or if you serve on one of our trips in South Texas or to the ends of the earth. You can use those questions. You just reframe them. Like, what do I like about the sermon? Now that I've heard it, how should I live different? Who do I know who needs to hear it? What did I like about this trip? What did I struggle with? What did this trip teach me about people and myself? Now that I've been on this trip, how should I live different? And who do I know who needs to go with me next time? Those questions, I pray, will be written on our hearts. By now, surely they are. <laughs> so share them with others. To get to know God better, to grow in the context of community, you know those questions are made for real life discussion and transformation. Every time we read the Bible, we should not just be finding information, but transformation. We should be transformed every time we encounter God's presence. And I want to be in a place that I refuse to close my Bible until I've received a, warm, a word from God that not only informs me, but transforms me. What if that's something that we seek to do this summer together? To sit in God's word. A summer has a different pace. And we want to read all the beach reads, that's fine. But don't forget this one. Don't forget God, what he has to show us. What might God want to use you to do for his glory? Not just you, but with others. I'm so encouraged by JL's story. Again, I don't know her motivation, but God used her according to his great purposes. And I'm glad we can talk about her today. I don't honestly know why so many of us know who Deborah is, but so few of us know who JL is. We're in the, they're both in the same story. We don't see either of them in Hebrews 11. I can't answer that for you either. But I love that we get to hear both of their stories today, along with Barak's, that we are in the kingdom of God, better together. Will you pray with me? God, I thank you so much for this spring semester of Woven Together. I thank you for the way that you are continuing to write our stories. That's what I see in Judges 4 and 5, that you are writing a greater story and that you are raising up and equipping and calling your kids to participate in that. And I'm astounded that you would use people, unlikely people, to do great things to accomplish your greater purpose. God, will you use us and would we not make the mistake of assuming who you can and cannot use? God, I pray that you would have us seek after you and that you would have us seek after those who are not like us to get to know them, to hear their story, and to see how you might want to use us together. I thank you for the conversation you made a way for me to have with that shop owner at the mall. God, I grieve the hurt that he has experienced in his life. I pray that both he and this girl who has been the love of his life will come to know you as truly Lord and Savior. I pray that they would come to know the true character of Jesus. God, that you are love, unmatched, unending, and unhindered. Father, forgive us for not seeing you that way and not sharing you that way with others. 
Teach us to come to know you as love for us and for others. There's nobody else like you. Amen.